Good morning and welcome to, well, the third Sunday of Advent, which if you are thinking about it, you're thinking, Pastor, things look slightly different this morning for our third Sunday of Advent, and you would be right. Things do look a little bit different this morning, but welcome, welcome. Glad that you are here. Glad that you are with us this morning. Glad we are still gathering for worship. And the reason things look a little bit different this morning is that, well, I clearly am not at church. <laughs> I'm at home this morning, and the reason for that is that um, I was um, in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID this week, and so out of an abundance of caution, and because I want to be consistent in what I say to the community is what I also do, I am doing this from home today. Worship is from home this morning because I want to, um, I need to listen to what the doctors say, and that means quarantining, that means not being um, over at church, that means not being in the same room with uh, Mr. Um, David Billy, who I talked to yesterday, and um, he'll be, he's at home today, but it's just me today. Um, and also that I think it's important that we listen and then we do what our physicians tell us to do in the midst of all of this. I will be going for a test probably today or tomorrow. They wanted to give me a few days so all of this would essentially um, work through the system so that if I did show any um, signs or symptoms, um, that it would register when they took the test. So I will be doing that um, either today or tomorrow. Um, but I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that we are still able, and this is the marvelous thing, we are still able to worship together even though, well, you get to see it from the um, living room here at the Grant household. <laughs> um, but welcome. If this is the first time that you are worshiping us with us, um, welcome. This is not normally how worship um, looks, but it is normally how worship feels. Because as we have learned, it is the gathered community. It is the way in which Jesus knits us together as the gathered community that makes us church. Not where we are, not the building that we happen to be in, or the fact that all of us are now sitting in our own rooms. And so in many ways, I'm just, this is my um, bit of solidarity with everybody who has been worshiping from home. I'm worshiping at home. Um, <laughs> and so welcome. Glad that you are here, and welcome to this third Sunday of Advent. It seems like Advent's just going, going right by, but it is good for us to take the time to celebrate the season of Advent. Now, I have a confession to make, and that is, um, at church, our candles are different right? We have three blue and one pink or rose-colored candle, and that would be the one that would be lit this Sunday, because this is the Rejoice Sunday, or Gaudé, which means joy. And we usually use a pink candle, but we don't have one at home. <laughs> and so, especially to Roland, my apologies. <laughs> um, but it is good for us to worship, it is good for us to take the time to embrace this season of Advent, the season of watching and waiting and preparation. It is good for us to gather as this family of faith in this important and meaningful time of the church year. And so with that, all said, um, Thank you for your willingness to be um, flexible um, this morning with worship being just a little bit different um, and definitely in a different setting, but thank you. And thank you for being here on this um, Lord's Day. So with that, let us begin. In the name of the Father and of the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In hope and expectation, let us gather around these candles to joyfully remember God's promise of salvation. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. Your prophets spoke of a day when the desert would blossom and waters would break forth in the wilderness. Bless us as we light the third candle. Strengthen our hearts as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. May he give water to all who thirst, for he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another, both those sitting right next to us and those of us who are reaching out across the miles. Peace be with you. <laughs> The other Pastor Grant just stepped in. So, <laughs> peace be with you, everyone. Um, let us share God's peace with one another. Let us pray. O God, source of our salvation, open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Word is among us. The Spirit is present. May the Lord add a blessing to this reading. Amen. Our first lesson for this third Sunday of Advent is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. Again, that's Isaiah, chapter 61. 1 through 4, and 8 through 11. The prophet writes, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the formal de former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. <clears throat> For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this Sunday is Psalm 126, and let us read that in unison. So I'll give you a second to find it in your scriptures. That's Psalm 126.
the psalmist writes, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson for this Sunday is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Again, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel for this third Sunday of Advent is from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 6 through 8, and then 19 through 28. John writes, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, They had been sent out from the Pharisees. They kept asking, they asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, good morning. Welcome. Glad that you are here. The text of Advent prompt us to hold off on getting too close to the manger and baby Jesus for a number of weeks. And sometimes we get a little impatient. But I think that waiting is important. And especially this week, as I've been thinking about the situation in the book of Isaiah, the song that Isaiah sings today, is a song to the returning exiles. And I would think, 
and I would argue that we have a sense of that this year. That time in exile. And it got me thinking, right? It got me reminiscing about the first time I did study abroad, where I was a professor for our university at the time, University of Texas Pan American, now the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And I was going to be a part of a group of faculty who were going to be teaching in Spain, Salamanca, to be very honest lovely little town in really the middle of nowhere. And so in late May of 2010, I stepped off a plane in Madrid, Spain. It was the first time I had flown internationally by myself. And you're thinking, well, honestly, pastor, you were an adult. This wasn't an issue. No, it wasn't. But it was still strange. After my flight, I waited for the next number of arrivals from the United States and Mexico because I was waiting for a number of my students, the students that I was responsible for, to get them from the Madrid airport to the Madrid bus station and then over to Salamanca, which was about a three-hour bus ride away. Now, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. You're a faculty member. This is, you know, you know what you're doing. Well, I had never been to Madrid before. I'd never been to Spain before, right? So I didn't really have a good sense of the whereabouts of the bus station. And frankly, my Spanish is terrible to non-existent, especially in Spain. Because the Spanish I was used to hearing from the U.S.-Mexico border and from all of my students who were all bilingual, right? Going to Spain for them was not going to be all that complicated, except for the fact that the dialects of Spanish spoken in Spain, Castellano, is really different than the Spanish you hear on the border of U.S. and Mexico. The grammar and the vocabulary are generally the same, but the dialects are about as similar as Michigan Midwest English as the English spoken by the residents of Glasgow, Scotland. And you're thinking, I don't get it. Google it later, especially sound files. Tell me that you can understand a typical Glaswegian without subtitles, right? It's the same language. <laughs> so I managed to shepherd the students all the way to Salamanca, got them through the cobblestone streets of the oldest university town in Spain, found our destination, one of the main lecture halls at the University of Salamanca. We were welcomed. We were given instructions on how the students were to meet up with their host families, because that's how they were going to have this truly immersive experience. Now, my students didn't need to learn the language, so we didn't have to do that, but they, that meant that they assumed that Everybody in our group was perfectly fluent, which was true for the students. And one of the other, well, all three of the other faculty members who were also fluent in Spanish. Not so much for me. <laughs> I briefly chatted with my students, talked about when classes were going to get started, and turned them loose. And that meant that I was on my own again. The other faculty members hadn't arrived yet. And so I needed to find my way to the hotel where we were going to be staying. The same hotel that they had been using for 20 or 30 years by this point. But I was new. I found my way to the hotel. We chatted briefly. I chatted briefly with the clerk about the fact that it was going to be much easier to take the stairs and not the elevator. Which she told me was... Um an adventure. <laughs> she told me that their version of breakfast would be served in the dining room between 7 and 8.30, and she showed me to my room. And she said, now, Dr. Grant, your room may feel a little small. And I'm thinking, that seems a unique thing to say. Aren't hotel rooms fairly standard? No, especially not in Europe. <laughs> As I was by myself for the first four weeks, and as the university was footing the bill for my hotel, 
they went with the most economic choice they could. My room was not small. It was microscopic, right? You opened the door and you ran into the bed. There was barely enough room for the bed, a nightstand, and what I assumed had to have been a child's desk. And that was it. Oh, and an even smaller bathroom. I settled it in, began to try to orient myself to the next six weeks of this adventure. Now, Denise and the kids would join me in about four weeks. It was an odd thing, and it is an odd thing to get used to a new city, a new country. It's not unwelcome, mind you, right? That's why I love to travel. That's why we love to travel. But it definitely throws you off your stride a little bit. The normal routine of life is wholly different. You have to find out where everything is. Grocery stores, bank, post office, the restaurants not designed for tourists. And in Spain, you have to get used to their very unique daily schedule. People are up pretty early. The workday starts. I mean, I was usually done teaching by 11 o'clock, both classes. And then you sit down for the midday meal. What I had not realized, I had read enough, but nothing in a guidebook or even talking to the other faculty was ever going to get me ready for what actually happened at the midday meal. The midday meal was massive, massive, right? Huge and pretty heavy on the wine, right? And then afterwards, everything shuts down for a siesta. I mean, everything, the chlor the, the the stores close, the restaurants shutter up as soon as they're done. Everybody goes home for a nap, which I understand. I had to sleep off that lunch. And then nobody eats dinner until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. I mean, I understood the siesta. You push yourself back from one of those midday dinner tables, and the only thing you can think about is sleep. I remember when the food first came out, right? We'd all, four of us had ordered and food started coming out. I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of food. But there's four of us, that makes sense. And the oldest professor, he goes, Ken, that's just yours. <laughs> and then I said, you know, and, and it came out and I was waiting. They said, no, go ahead, just eat, right? Because it was just one of those things that you get used to is that the food comes out when it's ready. And it doesn't all come out at once. And so it's okay because you're going to be there for a while. It's there for conversation and communication and getting to, you know, all of that. It's for community building. So here it was, new town, new country, new customs, new dialect, different schedule. And you start to feel a hint of the dislocation that had to have been the everyday lived experience of the Jewish exiles. The difference, obviously, was that I made this decision. My family would be joining me and my return home was already scheduled. And so it's only a glimpse. But I think this year, we have an even slightly better understanding of exile, a time of forced absence from a place of belonging, a time of forced absence away from essentially what we call home. This exile, not forced on us by a foreign invading army, but a pandemic, a disease that has altered everything and we have been exiled. We're all sitting in our homes, not together in church, but still church. But it is dislocating. And it's not just that we've been exiled from church, though that's what we most keenly feel when we're all together like this on a Sunday morning. But it's also that we feel like we've been exiled from the life that we're used to living. The change has been disruptive. The rhythm of life has been upended, and the normal routines and paths we trace in our lives are different, strange, alien. 
And what I have learned most clearly is that this sense of exile isn't new to African-Americans in the United States. This family of faith who have lived a form of exile in the country we all call home. An exile that we see played out in so many ways, social, economic, political, legal. The sense of exile is real. And it hurts. Because exile always bites deep. But it is into this, into all of this pain and dislocation that Isaiah sings. And the song that Isaiah sings is a song of hope. The song that Isaiah sings is a song of comfort. And the song that Isaiah sings is a song of strength. The song announcing that the exile is not the end of the story. Isaiah writes and sings, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These words are sung clear and loud for all of us to hear, and we need to take them both seriously and concretely. Because it needs to be said that modern Christians have had a bad habit of hearing this song, and so many like them in Scripture, and then theologizing the life right out of it. Right? We turn these words into something that are safe and anodyne, soft, domesticated, abstract. We palm all of this glorious imagery off as mere allegory, a metaphor, a collection of Hallmark greeting card platitudes. By the time we are done, and by the time too many Christians are done reading these words and the rest that are in today's first lesson, by the time they're done, it's nothing. It's mush the functional equivalent of a horoscope. But you see, and this is just absolutely vital, just absolutely imperative for us to understand, Isaiah wasn't speaking metaphorically. Listen to what he says. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. God singing through Isaiah wasn't theologizing. God wasn't being metaphorical. God wasn't being abstract. Isaiah's song reveals the very promise of God. The exiles will be brought home. And even though the exiles are unsure of what to expect when they return, the promise of God continues. It's not just a matter of returning the people to their rightful place. That, right, 
That's a great start, and that's where God starts in his love and his grace. But it's just a start. The covenant with the people extends to the world we all actually live in every single day. The ruins will be rebuilt. The former devastations will be raised up. The cities will be repaired. This isn't supposed to be just figurative speech. We're actually supposed to do these things. Part of the call to be a Christian is to live that faith in concrete ways, in specific moments, and not to just theologize all of Scripture into nothing. Good news will be brought to the oppressed, and that good news is that they will be oppressed no longer, that they will not be kept down, not held down by anybody. Good news will be brought to the brokenhearted. They will be restored. Recompense will be made. In Jewish custom, every 50 years, debts were forgiven. Not just metaphorical debt, real debt, monetary debt, right? People say we want to do what the scripture says. Let's start there. The exiles will stand tall and praise the God who remained faithful. These aren't just theological or spiritual concepts. God is faithful to the people in the here and now. And that means the call of God is to rouse us, to build up and raise up and repair our cities, our communities, and our neighborhoods. The gospel isn't abstract. Jesus doesn't simply speak in parables and then say, wasn't that a clever story? Wasn't that nice? Didn't that make you feel good? Well, it should, and then it should spur you to action. Jesus is always really clear about the reality that he wants to actually liberate people from sin right? Meaning, he wants them to stop doing it, to turn around and live, not just to say, oh, that's a lovely idea, Jesus, and I'll get around to that at some point. Jesus is like, no, get around to it now. That's the whole point of this. It's not theoretical, it's practical. When Jesus said the lame could walk, he made it happen. The lame could walk. The deaf could hear. The hungry were fed. The isolated and the castigated and the oppressed were lift up and restored to community. Every time Jesus heals somebody, every single time Jesus heals somebody, he restores not only their physical well-being, but he restores them to the community. They are once again a part of society. When Jesus is talking about restoration, he's not just tinkering around the edges. The lost will be found. The broken will be restored. This is the way. This is the truth. And this is the life that we have been called to live. This is what God does for us, what Christ does for us, what the Holy Spirit stirs in us every single day. We're not exiles. We have already been welcomed home, washed in the waters of baptism, and raised to new life. You're already home. 
No matter where you're sitting right now, you are a part of God's family. You are chosen and called precious and beloved. And we are home. We have been found. We have been restored. And now we're, shout, we're called to shout for joy for all of this and then get to work to shout out God's song so that all will hear, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We're supposed to go out there right now and use our hearts and our hands and our voices to shout so that nobody can say, I didn't know. We wonder right now where people are in the church. Where are they? Where have they been going? How often have we been raising our voices and lifting those voices in song and praise and worship and grateful thanksgiving and letting people know who it is that has brought us this far by faith? We are called to sing God's song so that everybody will hear it and respond to it. We're called to bring good news to everybody that we meet, starting with our families and our friends and the people that we meet. We are to bind up people's wounds. And even if we are not a doctor or a nurse or another person in the healthcare professions, we can heal just by being present to them. We are to proclaim liberty, to release the imprisoned. And frankly, that means forgive people. You can do that today, this very day, and you will have released one. We are to comfort those who mourn. Or to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, be the voice of the voiceless, to build up and raise up and repair. God is calling us to concrete action. God is calling all Christians to concrete action. And so, as we plan our return home from our pandemic exile, let us renew our efforts our commitment, our trust in the one who always seeks us out, who always brings us home, the faithful one, the one who never breaks the covenant, the one who sings of our liberation in our new day. For when God sings, it comes to pass through the work of our hands and our hearts and our voices. Amen. Good morning again, everybody. Glad that you are with us on this third Sunday of Advent. I've got a whole series of announcements this morning, but I want to start with um, birthdays, which we always do. Um, we have two birthdays, in fact, today. So you can either give them a call or just keep them in your prayers or just let them know somehow. Um, both Norma Bass and Juanita Spikes have birthdays today, and so... From our family to yours, happy birthday to Norma and Juanita. And on Wednesday of this week, Gina Harper Kirkland, Kirkland Harper, Gina, your birthday, happy birthday for your birthday on Wednesday. All right. Um, I have to say thank you so much to everybody who made this year's Adopt a Family program so amazingly faithful and successful. There was a lot of work that went into it. 
And for everybody who helped yesterday and throughout the week and throughout all of this run up to this, we did presents for 19 families from Marcus Garvey. And thank you to um, Sarita and Crystal for spearheading that this year. You did just getting right out there and doing that was amazing because we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it this year because we weren't sure how things were gonna turn out. Well, on top of that, we distributed 125 baskets of food yesterday. 125 full baskets, turkey, all the trimmings, everything that you could need for a holiday meal. That's amazing, and so I think Everybody who participated, everybody who donated food and money and time, but especially I want to say thank you to those who were there yesterday um, and Friday as well. But and I feel bad because I wasn't able to be there, but I knew that I was this is doing the right thing, which I hate doing that because it meant that I wasn't able to participate. But I want to say thank you to everybody who was there yesterday. So that's Miss Emma, Sarita, Mark, Ronnie. Rosa, Judy and Bill, Thurman, Dale, Michael, Clarence, Roland, Claire, Vashti, Shanika, Janine, Tamika, Darlene, Florence, and of course, the one who has put this all together from start to finish, and that's Jackie Dunbell, our Minister of Health and Social Concerns. Thank you to this marvelous team of people who lived out our faith, who did exactly what I was just preaching about, and that is putting our faith into concrete action. It is amazing. There are 125 families who will have a meal, and a good one, because of our efforts. And that is a cause for joy this day. And make no right bones about it. That is a good thing. And so thank you. Thank you for all of your hard work. Every single person who donated food and time and treasure. This is what it means to be a family of faith, to reach out into our community and to try in our own way to rebuild even just a bit. That's an amazing thing. So thank you. What a glorious, glorious thing. Thank you to everyone who continues to send in your tithes and your offerings. That is also an amazing thing. I didn't mention it in the sermon, but we've been at this coronavirus suspension for Genesis now for 40 weeks. Four, zero, 40. It's ridiculous, right? And we're saying, yeah, our exile has been long enough. Thanks very much, Pastor. We're ready. And I am too. I guarantee you that. But I'll also tell you this. Your faithfulness in your giving, you have made the difference. We're not just, you know, eking by. We're doing great, which means that we can do more for our community and for our congregation. And so I'd like to encourage you to keep it up. I know it's been hard, but I also want you to know that everybody in leadership, um, all the ministers have the greatest gratitude for everything that you have done. And so thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. And thank you for your continued prayers for this whole family of faith. We have expanded our reach rather a lot in these 40 weeks, and we have no intention of pulling back once we are actually back in the building. We're going to find new ways to reach out to our communities wherever, and our family, wherever they happen to be. 
Because even today, right, we're in Southeast Michigan, but we're also in the Carolinas and Texas and Wisconsin and probably Washington State. Um, and later today, probably we'll have um, one of our um, our members, right, from just outside of Birmingham in the UK. So this is this is an amazing thing. And the things that we are doing, it makes a difference. It is reaching out to one another in God's love and hope. And that's a good thing. Lastly, don't forget um, that to let people know about um, our worship on Facebook and also that all of these videos will be posted on YouTube so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and get all of this stuff. Um, which has been fun to kind of go back and look at. Um, and if there are some Bible studies or some of the classes that we've been offering or the children's um, Bible story time, all those videos are there. Um, so it's a great way to continue to say to other people who you're inviting to our community of faith, take a look, check us out. Um, don't mind the, you know, strange pastor that we've got. We're just dealing with him. <laughs> All right. I think those are all of the announcements for this morning. Let us now turn our hearts and our minds to prayer. Let us pray. God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Embed your word in their hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all of creation. Extend your kindness and relief to all of your glorious creation. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plan us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for people who have been displaced from their homes by fire, flood, earthquake, or storm. Support the work of uh, Lutheran World Relief and Lutheran Disaster Response and all of the disaster relief organizations in all of their recovery efforts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and the helpless, you clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of compassion and healing, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are sick or struggling with depression and gather all people in your healing embrace. We pray especially for those we name silently or aloud. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of community and belonging, we worship you in spirit and truth. 
give hope and renewal to all churches who not who are not yet able to worship together in person. St. James, grace in action, revelation, gracious Savior, cross of glory, love rising, and Iroquois Avenue Christ. Refresh Genesis with new dreams and renewed energy to vibrantly share your kingdom with all people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testify to your radiant love. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us join together to pray the prayer that Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long expected savior fill you with love. The unexpected spirit guide you on your journey now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness and prepare the way of the Lord. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for worship from a decidedly different venue this morning. I am deeply appreciative of your flexibility and your faithfulness. Have a blessed week. Look for ways to put your faith into concrete action. And let us... Join with Isaiah in singing God's song of hope and comfort and strength. Blessings, everyone. See you next time.